Good morning, everyone. This is Jeffy Kennedy, author of fantasy romance and romantic fantasy and other things as well. I'm here with my first cup of coffee. <sighs> Wonderful. <sighs> Today is, oh, are you guys going to say it with me? Say it with me. Today is Friday. Woo. Um, October 15th. Beware the Ides of October. Nobody worries about the Ides of October. Never mind. Uh, coming up on the, uh, the end of the year, as far as Celtic observances, Yiddish Hebrew as well, I suppose. Um, it's been a busy week, right? Lots of things going on. Super excited to see the reception for fire of the frost. You guys are awesome. Uh, we are this morning, um, at like 396 overall in the Kindle store and the whole freaking Kindle store and at like one, two and four in various anthology categories. It's rocking. We're very excited. Uh, oh, kind of a cool breeze. It's chilly this morning. It's, um, it's about 30 degrees Fahrenheit here, but I thought I would brave the garden while I still can, uh, be outside. Uh, it, it would be kind of nice, wouldn't it? <laughs> wouldn't it? I, I was kind of thinking maybe I should move the fire table out here under the grape barber because it's a little bit more protected, uh, than the portal. You don't get the view, but, uh, then I could do podcast with the fire table. I don't know if I could do it. Like you guys still wouldn't be able to see it. Right. I don't know. It's a thought. It's a thought, isn't it? Ah, uh, so, um, so yeah, it's Friday and I see my note from yesterday now amongst the leaves. Yeah. So that's just been great to see the anthology selling so well. Um, it's just fantastic you guys. And we're all excited. I did not work on the novella yesterday. I crashed again yesterday. Wasn't feeling good. I think we picked up some kind of bug when we were in Tucson, uh, cause we've all been feeling it. My mom hasn't been feeling good. Um, no, I don't think it's COVID. My mom's going to go see her doctor today if she's not feeling better. But I even went online and did the COVID self check and it came back with now, nah. <laughs> you know, I don't have a fever. Um, I did discover that one of the supplements I've been taking, I've been taking this one supplement first thing in the morning, bromelain, uh, it helps me with my allergies, uh, you know, helps with digestion, that kind of thing. I've been taking that for a really long time, but my favorite maker stopped making it. I got it from a different place. That's very reputable. But anyway, I figured out that I think that was making me sick in the morning, uh, because I did not take it this morning and I was fine. So that's nice. <laughs> uh, but yesterday I was feeling pretty rough. I went to writer coffee and that was fun. Um, had, had good conversation had my bolo latte, which made me very happy. <sighs> Why don't I have my own latte bowl? I should just order one and get one for myself. That would be nice. This, um, Clefoutis, the, the French place here in Santa Fe brings the latte in like a cereal bowl, if that's what you order. And yesterday, even this one lady stopped at my table and she you know, she had her mask on and everything. She was great. And she, uh, stopped by and she said, what is that that you ordered? And I said, it is the bolo latte. And she goes, Oh, I could totally tell she's going to order that next time. I feel like this is me bringing love to the world. Uh, my friend Jim Sorensen was asking me, uh, not long ago, what, what brings me joy? We were just talking about things that small things in life that bring us joy and one of, I said to him yesterday, as I was cupping my bolo latte in my hands, I said, this is the one of the things that brings me joy. So I need to find a, I do have one. I have a couple that are like 
smaller and rounder, but they have like other things on them. I want the smooth latte bowl. Uh, I could ask for it for Christmas, couldn't I? So, I mean, we are starting to think about midwinter holidays, right? Novellas and otherwise. Rosh Hashanah, Halloween, Thanksgiving, they all sort of come in a little row, don't they? So, um, it's nice to be feeling perkier. Now we just have to get David feeling perkier too. The garden hasn't completely frozen. I'm looking at a couple of my hanging plants. Uh, so I'm going to be doing some watering because now we're not supposed to hit freezing again for at least another week looks like. So, um, keep the garden coming along. Let it pack in its energy for the winter. You could see that, you know, like even the tender vines still have green leaves on them. It's a very Octoberish feel to me. So interesting comments yesterday on, uh, the, my talk about tropes as a lone female and like, and not like other girls. And a couple of you commented things like that. You don't understand why female authors do this, like, you know, even female authors, which is annoying to me too. But I wanted to explain a little bit about how this works because in some ways it's not, I don't want to say it's not their fault because we all must be uh, responsible for the things we do. You know, this is, this is going to be an aside, but something I've been noticing lately, uh, you know, like I understand, I am not a person with anxiety, so I have to be, um, you know, extend my compassion and tolerance on that sort of thing. But one thing I've really noticed is like, if somebody says something that is, um, I don't know, diminishes my joy in some way. And then this happened the other day, somebody said something that was critical and I was like, oh, okay, well, I can't do anything about that. And, and then later they came back and said, you know, my anxiety is bothering me. Um, I'm my, you know, and I know this is my anxiety talking, but I'm worried that, that I offended you. And it's like, well, I'm not offended. So don't be anxious. But at the same time, it's like, sometimes I think that that thing that we are now calling my anxiety talking, you know, is actually like the, oh, should I fucked up feeling? I mean, there, there has to be some way of distinguishing between the two because sometimes we fuck up and you have to be like, oh, I shouldn't have said that to you. That was, that was the wrong thing to say. Um, I should have kept my mouth shut, which is usually my takeaway. <laughs> my personal takeaway is Jeffy, keep your mouth shut. Um, not my forte, but my, the thing I always say is you should hear my, what I don't say. <laughs> I have so discreet. You guys, you have no idea. Uh, so anyway, that, that was a little bit of an aside. Uh, so I do feel like we have to take responsibility for these things. So, you know, like if I have the lone female trope in my book, um, yes, it's, it's my fault that I put it in there, but I want to explain how programming works because it's something that is not always within our conscious control, especially if we're not practicing that conscious control. Um, so, so here's, here's a good example. Um, for those of you who can drive a car, uh, if you can't substitute like riding a bicycle or something else that you do mechanical like that, something that was a difficult skill to master at first. So I remember when my stepfather was teaching me to drive a car and I was learning to drive on a stick shift because it was back in the day. Uh, and so I was learning all of the things I was learning to, um, depress the accelerator at the same time you release the clutch, two different feet and shift and <laughs> steer and traffic laws and other cars and all of those things. And there's so much shit to pay attention to. There's so much stuff going on and you have to think about every single one of these things. And it's, 
it's overwhelming and exhausting. Similar with like learning to ride a bike because you're learning to balance and you're trying to figure out like where the things on the handlebars are and do you do the brakes with your feet or with your hands and all of this stuff, right? So eventually you don't have to think about all of that stuff anymore, right? Uh, when you're driving your car, you don't have to think about every single traffic law. You don't have to think about, um, a lot of times you don't have to think about where you're going because if you're driving a familiar route, you just drive it. And this is one of the ways that our brains work in order to conserve energy so that you can think about other stuff. So now like if you are driving to the grocery store, you go out and you get in your car and you drive to the grocery store and the whole time you're thinking about what are you going to buy at the grocery store and you're going through your mental list of and maybe you already have a list but you're thinking what did I forget to put on the list and oh would not it be nice to make this this weekend I should remember to grab this also and how much laundry detergent do I really have and you're thinking about all those things and before you know it you're at the grocery store right you're getting out of the car and maybe you pause and write down those couple things on your list that's what I have to do or I'll forget them again and you'll have no memory of driving to the grocery store which is sometimes people think oh well you know I haven't been really present okay well maybe you weren't really present for every moment of that scintillating experience of driving to the grocery store that you've driven to a thousand times and will drive to a thousand times more. Well, you were really present in your other thoughts. Maybe you were thinking about your story. That's me a lot of times. I'm thinking about daydreaming about my characters. Anyway, this is this is how our brains compartmentalize and give us room to have other kinds of thoughts because if we were thinking about every single little thing that we're doing all the time, we would have no brain capacity left for anything else. So so that's actually a gift when you you know and sometimes it can be disconcerting because you've driven a hundred miles you know you're driving a, you know from here to Tucson or something and you've driven a hundred miles and you don't really you know my mother will text and say where are you and I'll be like huh, I don't know looking around for a landmark. It's it can be a little disconcerting that there's like this part of your brain that's in the background going no no it's okay I got it handled we passed Lordsburg it's cool just keep driving. Um, it that's helpful. It, it's like having um, it's like having a servant staff inside your own head right that's handling these things for you so that you can be preoccupied with the running of the estate. How's that for an analogy? So this is the way that programming is really good for us because we make things into habit and this is part of why I hammer a lot of times on building a writing habit because if you have a writing habit there are aspects of that that are being handled by your mental staff that you don't have to do which is you know like getting yourself to the keyboard and getting you in place and preparing you to release the words so that you can be thinking about what those words will be. My fingers are getting cold. I might have to put on actual gloves instead of my wonderful outlander Claire fingerless gloves which are starting to get worn I'm very sad they're coming apart something else to ask for new fingerless gloves. I love these because they're amethyst color. I do have another pair but they're brownie. Nothing wrong with brown but they're not amethyst. So programming uh, when we learn things when we learn things like story structure from the time we're we're we and our parents are reading to us and we internalize things about how stories are set up. We internalize tropes which is why you know you get the occasional arrogant asshole <laughs> sorry uh, the, you know some of the literary fiction types I should mention about that the one the kerfuffle this week um, if I remember I will but you know you'll get these people saying well I don't use story tropes because my stories are completely original I want my stories to be original and they have to say it in that kind of tone too very plummy. <laughs> but we internalize story tropes we we know what they are um, we recognize them we want to recognize them 
we want to uh, enjoy them. And certain kinds of readers are very um, open about this is the trope I love. Give me more of this trope. Uh, you could tell me a thousand stories with this trope and I will be delighted. So we internalize a whole lot of these things. And, and this is the same kind of thing that we've ha- been having with our conversations about misogyny, with racism, with privilege, with all of these kinds of things that as we grow up, we internalize the way things are. And when somebody confronts us with the concept that maybe this is wrong, it's upsetting. Um, you know, like people being upset about Columbus day, what's wrong with Columbus day. And it's like, well, Columbus day honors someone who was a vile human being. And we need to instead honor the indigenous people who were victimized by this rapacious European behavior. It's like, I totally understand if you have good childhood memories of Columbus day, you know, nothing can take that away from you, but it's, it's time to change our thinking about this, change up that trope, change up what you've internalized. So when this happens, when it pops out in a story, uh, like this saying, uh, lone female among men, it's the writer going along and telling the story. And she's like, my heroine is a fighter. She is unique and she is interesting. And so this trope, this idea, this programmed misogyny pops out. Oh, well, it's not that all women are fierce fighters and individual creatures. It's that mine is the lone woman among men. She is not like other girls. Uh, somewhere along the line, we internalize this thing about needlework along with yes, arguably, and some of you have made this comment, you know, anything feminine, any kind of task that is considered to be traditionally feminine is layered with contempt. And we have all picked this up and we've internalized it, that the things women do are not valuable. And it's not our faults that we believe this, uh, but at the same time, it is incumbent upon us to examine these beliefs, wring them out, turn them inside out, see if, if there is actual truth to them, or if it's just something that somebody decided somewhere, some man who thought, oh, all those silly women do is gossip and do needlework all day. and. Therefore, uninteresting women do needlework. And so now when we're writing fast and we're just wanting to tell the story and it's like, oh yeah, and she hates needlework because anybody worthwhile hates needlework. And it's like, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Why do we think this? We had this conversation at Writer Coffee yesterday about gossip and the importance of having conversations and communicating what's going on. And that gossip is again, something that is, uh, used contemptuously in terms of women talking to each other, but women talking to each other is a very, very important way of trading information, right? It's, it's not gossip. If you know, it's not gossip, what does gossip mean? So these are things to examine. If you have something where you think, oh, well, I want to distinguish my female character by making her different in some way, look at, look at what you're saying look at what you're using is for those details. And it's, it's a constant process. I mean, I do it too. I find myself doing it. I was like, ah, have to, it's, you know, you just have to snap yourself out of that auto driving mode and, and be present in the moment. And sometimes you do it in revision. You weed that stuff out. Um, kerfuffle this week, uh, somebody, (laughs) blah, 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 um, published, there was an article published by a writer and, uh, someone else tweeted about it. And that was all I read because the tweet told me everything I needed to know. And I wasn't going to give the article any clicks, which is no doubt their intent because they love to publish this controversial stuff so that people will get annoyed and outraged and click on their site. But this writer said that it literary fiction, um, said that it was an insult to the author not to finish their book. And it prompted a great discussion of the DNF that did not finish. And, uh, 
the the tweeter, the person who tweeted about their friend's book and article said that they went on holiday and took only that book along to force themselves to read all 1349 pages. Um, and that they were really glad they did. And I was like, my initial reaction is this sounds like no fucking holiday. I want to go on, (laughs) um, you know, this idea that you owe it to the author, um, that it's an insult to the author to not keep reading. I mean, I, I almost want there to be like a, is this my anxiety talking that I feel insulted that someone doesn't want to finish my book? It's like, Jesus, people, sometimes people are not going to like your book and you know what? Reading should be a joy. I I'm just going to go full stop on that. Reading should be a joy. You should never force yourself to read anything. Certainly not because you owe the author anything. I'm going to put this out there that I think as a reader, as a reader myself, we owe authors one thing and one thing only, and that is to pay for their work. If we read their books, we should pay for their work. Full stop. If you pay for it and don't finish it, it's not an insult. The only insult is if you steal it, don't steal books, don't pirate books, don't read books, uh, for free that, you know, libraries are fine. Uh, but you know, make sure it comes from a legitimate source. Otherwise, Jesus. I mean, if, if you write a 1349 page book and then you're upset that people don't want to read it, um, maybe you need to do a little self-examination there. Just saying on that note, I'll remind you all that first cup of coffee is part of the frolic media podcast network, and you will find more podcasts you love at frolic.media slash podcasts. And I will talk to you all on Monday. Have a wonderful weekend. Um, be in the moment or go on autopilot and think about other things, whatever it is. I hope you do whatever brings you joy. You all take care. Bye-bye.